he's still here this morning. But you know what? The same book in chapter 9, 28, Hebrews 9, 28, says Christ suffered once to bear the sins of many. Isn't that good? But more than this, we aren't just dealing with sins. See, as Christians, we've been forgiven. How many know you've been forgiven? Amen. Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. But there's a world out there that they're not forgiven. The gift has been purchased for them. Christ paid the price for their sin too. John tells us that he died not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. But they haven't received the gift. If I was to buy you a gift for Christmas or your birthday, it might be an expensive gift. I may pay so much money for it. But if I offer it to you in a wrapped box and you say, I don't want your gift, you'll never benefit from what's in the box. Jesus paid for salvation. He paid for your salvation. And you received it. That's why your hands went up. But the people out there haven't. I want to just say something here. That the, you know, the vision of every church, every church needs to have this vision. And, and it could be manifested in different ways. But here's a vision. Okay, this is the vision for the church. The first part of the vision we were actually involved in when we were worshiping that wonderful time of worship this morning. Because the first part of the vision is to be upward. A vision needs to be first upward towards the Lord in worship and in relationship with Him. Amen. The second part of a vision, and this is where a lot of people miss something. The second part, the second part of the vision that every church needs to have is inward. And that means we edify one another. And so when we come to the house of the Lord, please, we, we, we often have this idea that it's what am I going to get when I go to church? And you know, I've changed that. It's now in my life, what can I give to be a blessing when I go to church? When I attend the house of God? I am there to edify someone else. And by doing so, you'll be edified. Amen? Do you follow me? So it's upward, it's inward, and then the third one, and the third one only follows after we got the first two right. The third one is outward. And that's what people often call evangelism, which is the Great Commission. But you can't do the Great Commission until you're upward right. You have to have that relationship with the Lord first. And then the church needs to be strong. It needs to be edified. That means built up. And then we're ready to bring people to the house of God to get them saved. And go out and tell them and compel them to come in. Amen. So that's basically the vision of every church. But people will come in and maybe... Maybe this is you as well. You come and you know you're forgiven, but you also recognize there are areas of your life that the, that the sociologists call dysfunctional. How many have ever heard the word dysfunctional? You know, I never knew I was dysfunctional. I grew up in the family and, you know, I said, oh, we're perfectly beautiful family. And as I grew and I, as I grew in the Lord, I realized, oh, I have some dysfunctions I didn't even know. I, I thought we had the perfect Italian family. You know? What's wrong with pasta and meatballs and the whole thing, you know? But we, we just didn't realize, you don't realize you have these dysfunctions until somehow you have something to compare it to. And then you see, whoa, you know, I have this problem and that problem, but yet I have got saved, I came to Christ, and a lot of the stuff fell off. But there are still some things in my life that God's working on. How about you? Amen? And these things, we call them dysfunctions. And listen, these are old-fashioned problems, as old as the Bible. People had the same problems way back in Bible times. When you look at the people in the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of those people, the apostles in the New Testament, they all had some dysfunctions. I mean, just look at Abraham. He told the Pharaoh, hey, that's not my wife, it's my sister. Why? Because he was trying to save his own neck, and he had taken his wife and called her his sister, and the Pharaoh almost took her as his own wife, and that would have been really bad. <laughs> and then you look at somebody like Peter, oh, we don't have to even talk about him. I mean, talk about dysfunctions. So you see, it's nothing different. People are still people, and you and I are here, and we're forgiven, thank God. But you know what I've learned? If I recognize a sin in my life, I tell the Lord this. I say, God, I know you forgive me as I confess my sin. You are faithful and just to forgive me for my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Oh, I love 1 John 1, 9. But then I realize 
I tell God, I don't want to just be forgiven. I thank you for that. I want to be delivered. Yes. I don't want sin in my life. That's right. I don't want to be in bondage to anything. I want to be free to serve the Lord. Yes. Amen? Anybody amen here? Amen. We want to be free. And there are times, you know, we just somehow, and we, we don't even know sometimes, uh, some things from our past we just never dealt with. Well, we're forgiven, you know, but there are some consequences left over. Because we've made some ties to things that we just never renounced. We never said, I renounce that thing. Or even in this life, sometimes we make decisions that aren't the best. And sometimes we let the devil get a grab onto us a little bit and he kind of squeezes us because we open the little door here. Now we say, God, forgive me for something, but what about the little tie? You know, the devil puts a little hook into you and he's kind of got you on a string. You know what I'm saying? And he's not possessing you. Christians cannot be possessed by the devil. You can't be possessed because the Holy Ghost is in you. But you can be oppressed. The devil can come and lean on you. If, you, if somebody was standing here, I'd push on their shoulder, push down. You know, and you can feel that weight. And every time you go to do something, particularly something brings its head up. And it's like, ugh. And it prevents you from moving forward in God. Maybe it's a spirit of fear. Maybe it's a spirit of unforgiveness. Maybe it's something that keeps holding you back from being, as they used to say on the commercial, all that you could be in God's army. I mean, God needs to use us. He's aware of what's going on in the world today. When we look in the Bible, we find that the people of God were in Egypt, and he told Moses, I have heard their cry, and I know the oppression they're under. God knows the oppression that we're under. Many people in this culture are under some oppression. And if you're a Christian today, as you are, you are also feeling the oppression of the evil around you. But let's be careful, because Jesus said in the last days, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. We don't want to grow cold in our love for God or even for the lost. Amen? Amen. The, the world today needs a touch from heaven. But God wants to use us. But many times we're so dysfunctional, we're so worried about ourselves. We're so wrapped up in our problem. We run to pastor, pastor, I need counseling. There are so many pastors that have been counseling till they're blue in the face. And the people just keep coming for the same thing. God wants to deliver us from these dysfunctions. Why? So that we can have a touch of heaven and bring a touch of heaven to others. Ministers in every church where I have been and pastors I know are going through that. People coming to the church saying, oh, but this and all that. If you look in the Christian bookstore at the kinds of books that are available, many of them are about people, oh, how to get over this dysfunction, this, this thing, the how-to books, you know. And, and I ask myself, why are Christians so messed up? <laughs> hey, I tell it like it is here today. Amen. You know, it's okay. If you're messed up, it's all right. You're in the right place. But you know, the church is like a magnet for dysfunctional people. You know? It's like a magnet. I used to, when I was pastoring, get the strangest people. And it's like, you know, and you can't really help them because, and please, I don't mean to offend anybody, but all they do is want to latch on to the pastor or to people in the church, and it's gimme, gimme, gimme. That's what they have a gimme, gimme, gimme attitude because I'm so poor and I'm so messed up. And they have this mentality, a poverty mentality, an I'm messed up mentality, and do not recognize that God creates new creatures when they come to Him. That's right. Yes. Yes. Amen. So it's just that there are so many people who never change. They go on with the counseling. They go on with people, you can pray over them. I, I, you ever pray for people, Pastor, and you're praying for them, and you can tell they're not even praying with you. They're like, it's like putting your hand on a stone. And praying for a cold rock. I don't know. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like, it's like, you have to be a part of it. You've got to stand up and you've got to say, Jesus is my Lord. I renounce Satan. And I renounce this sickness. I renounce this bondage. And I will have no more part of it because Jesus is the one I serve. Amen. You see, it has to do with who's the Lord in your life. Who's master in your life? And do you remember that he's master in your life? His name is Jesus, right? Amen. Amen. See, Jesus didn't just come to forgive your sins. 
He came to deliver us from evil. Amen. 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 He came to deliver us from the things that sin brings with it. So it seems like the church, I say, is a magnet for dysfunctional people, but I want to tell you it's a good thing because this is where people who are dysfunctional need to come. This is where they, but they don't come to stay dysfunctional. We don't come to stay that way. We came to change. Not just say, well, I'm forgiven, but I'm set free. Amen. Because you know why? Because the Bible says that He has come to save us to the uttermost. Not just a little bit, not just partially. Where is the blessedness in, in the church today? Where is the blessedness when we're in the midst of troubles? It's, it, the troubles do not define who we are. Things like that are not really to define us. Could it be for a lot of us? And please remember, I'm trying to help today. I'm not trying to offend anyone. But it, can it be this? Because I'm speaking from experience as well, because sometimes I think I've done this in my life. Could it be that the Bible is too much of a theory instead of reality in our lives? That's a danger. When we think of the Bible as just nice words that are very flowery, but don't really change me, don't really have an effect on me. You see, this is how I look at it. And I hope that you will look at it this way too, because it's how Elijah looked at it. And he said this when he was on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18, 21. If Yahweh is God, then follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Choose today who you will serve, Joshua says. Which is it going to be? If God is God, then let him be God. The God who answers by fire, he's God. Amen. Amen. And I say, God, you need to answer by some fire here today. Amen. Amen. Want some fire today? Amen. We're not talking about literal fire. Amen. We're talking about Holy Spirit fire, yes. or as they used to say in the old days, Holy Ghost fire. Yes. That's what we need. It's still true today. If God is who he said he is, if the, if the apostles taught truth about God, and I believe they did. If God is who he said he is, if Jesus is who he proclaimed to be, then why do we have so many hang-ups in Christians? Where is the blessedness? We need a touch from heaven. We need a touch from heaven. I Every day I need a touch from heaven. I'm not exempt. I need a touch from heaven. I speak because I know what it's like. I know what bondage is like. I say, I renounce you, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Everybody all right? Yes. Amen. So why do we have so many hang-ups? Why do pastors have to be like dentists? <laughs> you know, pulling teeth. You know, I used to say that in the ministry, in the pastorate. Oh, pastoring is like pulling teeth. Actually, you know, when I was pastoring, I actually worked in a dental office to supplement my income. So it was very real to me. I knew about that. <laughs> so why do we have such problems? That's what I, I often ask. So I'm going to tell you why, and I don't like the answer. But the truth will set you free. Yes, you know, the truth's always not the fun thing, is it? But to hear the truth's not always easy. I don't like it because it fits me too. That's why I don't like the answer. But the answer is what it is. And here it is. Over the years, we have come to understand that somehow, now listen to this, somehow the gospel is all about me. We have become self-centered. We have gotten a me gospel preached today in America. And maybe in the world too. But it's not about, it is about me and it's about you. But it's not just about me and you. And that's where we've missed it. Because we think, what will the church do for me? What will God do for me? And if you're focused on yourself, you see, you're not going to be like Abraham. Abraham, by faith, was declared righteous. Do you know why? He says he didn't look at himself, but he considered God who is able to keep his promises. You see, if you keep looking at yourself, you're going to continue to be dysfunctional because you are not your answer. Come on, you've got to get more excited than that. <laughs> I'm more excited than that. Your, your, your reaction is not as excited as I am. Okay? You're not reacting in, in sync with my excitement here. That's okay. That's all right. I'm going I'm to still be excited. See, it's about much more than me and you. It's about a great commission. It's about the old-fashioned gospel. It's about the old-fashioned problem of the human race. You know, people used to say...